This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Father and our God, there is only one foundation upon which we build our lives, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So I pray that we would, by your grace and for your glory, may our lives be rooted and grounded to the finished work of Jesus Christ, that even this hour we would be reminded through song and through confession and profession of faith, through the preaching of the gospel, we would be reminded of your finished work that we gather on the Lord's day as the people of God have gathered for 2,000 years to celebrate that you were dead but then alive on that first day of the week, raised for our justification so that we could live in light of the glorious freedom and liberty that we have in Jesus the Christ. We pray this in the name of the one who taught his own when they prayed to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and give us our debts. We forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen.
Amen. You may be seated. You know, the words we just sung are such a good reminder for us as we enter into this time of confession. You know, when we, when we do these things each week, this liturgy of confession, assurance, hearing the word, even being brought to the table in the Lord's Supper, they are not just checklist things for us to be able to attain some standing before God. It's actually the opposite. It's God reshaping our hearts each week as we gather in this hour set aside for worship that we might fix our eyes on him, proclaiming the faith and the justification and the promises that we have in Christ. So together, would you pray with me and confess in unison using the prayer that's in your bulletin and on the screens as we come before our holy God. Let's confess to him. Gracious Heavenly Father, Thank you for your compassion for the lonely, oppressed, and harassed peoples of the world. You sent Jesus to seek and to save the lost, but we confess our reluctance and fearfulness to personally engage in his mission. Forgive us for being more apathetic than active, isolated than involved, callous than compassionate, obstinate than obedient, legalistic than loving. Have mercy upon us and forgive us, for we pray in the exalted name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. And now let's continue to confess our sins because God sees us in public, but he also judges our hearts. Let's confess in silence. God, you interrupt our confession with your grace. Even in our place of need, you have provided everything for us in the person of Christ. In this moment, as a church gathered here, your people, would you renew us in spirit and in our minds? And would you transform us into the image of Christ, starting right now, knowing that all those in you by faith are forgiven, are accepted, our loved, our heirs. This is beautiful, and it's possible only because of the matchless work of Christ our Savior, in whose name we pray, amen. Galatians 2 says, Paul saying to the church, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, so that the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith through the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you believe that? Have you taken hold of Christ by faith, knowing that the baggage that you brought in, no matter how bad your week was, that you are loved in the person of Christ? If you believe that, and you live your life through him by faith, I can say to you, Christian, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Caleb. Well, several times throughout the year, we have an opportunity to celebrate and recognize the largest ministry of our church, Westminster Academy. And it's typically on the Sunday before school begins that we have one of those Westminster Academy spotlights. School goes back in session for the 2023-2024 school year this Tuesday. Had an incredible board retreat this weekend as we talked about the future and God Uh, just his grace and his providence of how he continues to grow and build and sustain the school. If you're new to Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, it was in 1971 uh, that God gave the vision to Dr. D. James Kennedy, our founder, and several other families, key families, and they had the audacious vision, could we here at 56 and Federal establish an academy that not only pursued academic excellence, but also spiritual vitality. And over 50 years ago, that dream became a reality. Over 50 years, Westminster Academy has been raising up the next generation 
of kingdom citizens to be sent out into the world. We've heard from some of those kingdom citizens this morning, Angelina and Isabella Mesquita, as they played and led us in worship in the prelude. We're going to hear from another kingdom citizen in a few uh, moments as senior Aaron Fitzgerald leads us in song and in, in worship. And there's so many in our midst and throughout our congregation and community uh, that have been shaped by the mission and vision of Westminster Academy. Your pastor has been shaped by this institution. My wife and our family continues to be shaped by this institution. And so we have an incredible opportunity uh, to pray and to thank God for his great faithfulness through the institution of WA for over 50 years. What I'd like to do this morning, I would like to invite our headmaster, Dr. Joel Satterley, and his senior leadership team and our school board chair, George Barber, to join me on the top step of the chancel. As the headmaster and school board chair and senior leadership team from the headmaster's office is joining me on the top step, I'd also like to recognize um, all of our school board members, faculty and staff. Could you just stand where you are seated? If you're a school board member, staff, or faculty, could you please stand? And let's recognize them. And stay standing. When you look up here or you look around the congregation, you're looking at missionaries. Well, Pastor, I thought missionaries go across the sea and, and, and travel to foreign countries. No, these are missionaries that are sent out right across 56th Street to capture and to shape the minds and the hearts of the next generation. And so would you join me in prayer as we pray uh, for our headmaster and for his senior leadership team? Our headmaster, Dr. Joel Satterley, just over a year ago graduated from Knox Seminary with a doctorate in ministry, and what he pursued as his project was to develop a Biblical Worldview Institute. The real reason I share that with you is that for over 50 years, this has been one of the marks of Westminster Academy, that we would train the next generation with a Biblical Worldview, a framework for all of life that is informed by the Word of God. And so I share that with you to celebrate that the legacy of this ministry continues, that God is faithful from generation to generation. And so would you join me in prayer as we pray for our headmaster, school board chairman, our school board and the senior leadership team, and all of our faculty and staff in our midst, and the over 1,000 students that will descend upon this sanctuary on Tuesday morning for convocation and across the street for the beginning of the 2023-2024 year. Let's go before the throne of grace together. Would you pray with me? Our Father and our God, Lord, we do recognize that you are the one that has established your kingdom, and it is an everlasting kingdom that you promise will endure from generation to generation. Lord, all throughout history, it has seemed like the kingdom of God was on the brink of extinction. It seems like a generation would be lost completely. But Lord, it is through ministries like Westminster Academy for over 50 years that has been a light in the midst of the darkness, raising up a generation that understands that it's more than just going out and pursuing a calling, but to pursue a calling for the sake of the kingdom of God. I thank you for everyone represented on the top step of the chancel this morning from our headmaster to our school board chair, to all of our principals and our administration. Lord, I pray that you would overwhelm those gathered up here and those scattered throughout our midst, faculty and staff and school board members, that they would remember what we often talk about, that we are owners of nothing but stewards of everything. May we steward this mission and vision well for the sake of the next generation for the sake of the kingdom of God. Lord, would you overwhelm even the Satterley family this weekend and into next week. Would you bless all of the families represented here in this room, protect them against the evil one, and would you remind them of their sacred and holy calling, that every moment in the classroom, every moment on the field, every moment in the stage is a sacred and holy moment. Would you give them grace and wisdom as they pursue this calling for your glory? And so we pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.
and God be with you as you go. And I believe Aaron is here, and we will uh, continue uh, with the spirit of worship as Aaron Fitzgerald Sr. at Westminster Academy leads us in song. Thank you, Aaron. What a, what a powerful way to see the Lord's prayer expressed, be brought to his throne, to the throne of grace. Let's stand and profess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed, joining together with one voice, Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
be seated. Just a few announcements as we continue in worship. Encourage all of you, like always, to read through the bulletin when you go home. Uh, there's announcements about what is happening in the life and the ministry of Coral Ridge. Please read through it inside and particularly the events coming up that are highlighted on the back. On this Westminster Academy Sunday, some of you might not be familiar with this ministry. If you'd like to find out more information about WA, there is a booth in the back. Our director of admissions, Austin Elmer, will be back there along with our headmaster, Dr. Joel Satterley, to answer any questions you might have. Maybe you're thinking about this for your family. Maybe you have a grandchild, family, friend, neighbor that would be interested in being a part of God's great work at Westminster Academy. So please make sure that you check out the booth in the back of the service. And also, I, I'm going to take a point of pastoral privilege right here because I spotted her during the Ministry of Music. But I think it's appropriate on this Westminster Academy Sunday that our, the wife of our headmaster emeritus, um, as you know, Ken Wackus, is our headmaster emeritus, and I spot Ruth Wackus, his widow. Uh, Ruth uh, has been brought back to Coral Ridge and to South Florida, so Ruth Wackus, would you please stand and be recognized? Um, so great to have you back and Karen and Tony that back at Westminster Academy in South Florida and Coral Ridge. Ken Wackus was my headmaster, was the headmaster for my wife. And as we're going to talk about in the sermon today, the importance of a biblical worldview, uh, we owe so much of our worldview being shaped uh, to the ministry of Ken Wackus at uh, Westminster Academy and, and for you and for your partnership in that great work, Ruth. Uh, so grateful to have you home here at Coral Ridge. Our anthem for this morning is Great is Thy Faithfulness. And this arrangement in particular is special uh, to the history of our church. We pursued one of the great arrangers of our day, Dan Forrest, to arrange this arrangement of Great is Thy Faithfulness for the 60th anniversary of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. And I think it's only appropriate that we sing this great anthem and this great hymn of the faith today, that we're reminded of the great faithfulness of God here at Coral Ridge, the great faithfulness of God at Westminster Academy. So would you allow the choir to sing over you and to prepare your heart to hear from God's word.
please remain standing for the reading of God's word. This week we are looking at Romans chapter 12, simply two verses, one and two, in a message entitled, Worldview Matters. The Apostle Paul was writing to Christians in Rome, under uh, Christians in Rome under Roman occupation, under Roman persecution, with a predominant pagan worldview. This is the world in which Paul writes to the Christians in Rome. They needed a worldview that was not informed by the spirit of their age, but instead needed a worldview that was informed by the word of God. This was a problem 2,000 years ago and remains a problem today. Recently, George Barna surveyed, and he said that under 10% of North American Christians operate with a biblical worldview, that less than 10% of Christians in North America view all of life and think through all of life with another grid other than the infallible Word of God. Worldview matters. Romans 12, verses 1 through 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The grass withers and the flower fades, but know not the word of our Lord. It stands forever. Amen. You may be seated. Worldview matters. Paul says to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He was saying that the way to be transformed in the Christian life is to not check our minds at the door, but instead have our minds renewed, renewed by the living word of God, to have every thought take captive by Jesus Christ. Future generations in the church will be directly impacted by the priority that this generation places on developing young men and women with a biblical worldview. Future generations will be directly impacted by the priority that this generation places on developing young men and women with a biblical worldview. You might be here this morning and the concept of a worldview seems foreign to you. Let me offer two helpful definitions. The first is by Francis Schaeffer. Francis Schaeffer said a worldview is the grid through which one sees the world. Nancy Percy in her book Total Truth says a worldview is the sum total of our beliefs about the world, the big picture that directs our daily decisions and actions. A worldview is the framework, a grid, by which we see the world and all of life. And the question is not whether you have a worldview or not. The question is what is informing it. Someone once said that there's only two options for a worldview— either a theistic worldview or an atheistic worldview. And so I ask you today, whether you're 10 or pressing 100, what is informing your worldview? Our headmaster, Dr. Joel Satterley, often reminds his faculty and staff that a child between kindergarten and 12th grade has 16,000 instructional hours in the classroom. And make no mistake about it, those 16,000 hours are being used for better or for worse to shape worldview. How do we as a church, as the people of God, pursue a biblical worldview? Three keys this morning looking at Romans chapter 12. The first thing I want to point out to you is that a biblical worldview is first and foremost grounded in the gospel In verse 1, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore. Therefore is there for a reason. Therefore is Paul's way of transitioning. He is pivoting. 
if you're new to the book of Romans and never read through it or studied this epistle, Paul has spent 11 chapters unpacking rich Christian doctrine and theology. He has unpacked the gospel. He has unpacked justification and total depravity. He has unpacked sanctification. He has unpacked these rich theological truths. And so when he uses the word therefore, he is pivoting. But what he is saying is what I'm about to tell you concerning the Christian life is all grounded in the 11 chapters that I've just shared with you. Why is that important? Because how we think and how we act must be grounded not in what we do, but what in Christ has done for us. That's the difference between God-centered theology and life and man-centered philosophy and life. The difference between theism and atheism. Paul wants us to understand that this treatise starting in chapter 12 concerning Christian life and Christian ethics is all grounded in what I've taught you the previous 11 chapters. How do we live in, such a, in light of such a rich mercy? How do we live in light of the gospel of Jesus Christ? We need a worldview that is not only grounded in the stories of the Bible, but we need a worldview that is grounded in the story of the Bible. That Jesus Christ from beginning to end and his life and his death and his sacrificial death and his resurrection and ascension is what informs our world view. What we do is informed by what Christ has done for us. This is a matter of identity, so that our identity is not grounded in our works, in our work righteousness, but our identity and how we think and how we act and how we live out the Christian life is solely grounded in the finished work of Jesus Christ for us. So the first key to a biblical worldview, therefore, a worldview is grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The second thing I want to point out is not only is a biblical worldview grounded in the story of Jesus and the gospel, but secondly, a biblical worldview does not conform to the world. Paul starts by explaining the Christian life with a negative. He says the Christian life is one that is not conformed to this world. It literally means to be pressed into the mold of this world. It's interesting, the word world here in this passage is not cosmos. He's not talking about the physical world, but he's actually talking about the age. The word world here is translated ion, meaning age. Paul will often talk about the spirit of the age. And so what Paul is saying is that a worldview is not conformed to the spirit of this age. We said in the beginning that the spirit of the age in the first century was Greco-Roman paganism. And that was the predominant worldview of the day. That was the spirit of the age. And he is saying your worldview, how you think and live, cannot be conformed to the spirit of that age. What's the spirit of our age today in the 21st century? There's many ideologies we could point to, but one of the most predominant ideologies is secular humanism. To be secular simply means to be divorced from the things of God. A secular society means that religion and the things of God have no place in society or the public square. Humanistic philosophy simply says that man is the ultimate aim of all things and not God. So you combine these deadly fatal philosophies together and you have secular humanism and that is the predominant philosophy of our day and marks the spirit of our age that unfortunately many Christians are being swept away with. And Paul says, don't do it. Do not be conformed to the spirit of of this age. How do we see secular humanism in our day? Well, one of the ways that we see it and one of the most predominant ways we see it is through public education. There is no greater influence on the next generation and those 16,000 hours than public education in North America. 
I received this quote from our good friend, Dr. Peter Loback, who's with us this morning, just on Friday. It was a quote from C.F. Potter, who was the signer of the Humanist Manifesto. He was an associate of John Dewey, considered the father of progressive public education. And this is what Charles Francis Potter said. Education is thus a most powerful ally of humanism. And every public in school is a school of humanism. What can their theistic Sunday school meeting for an hour once a week and teaching only a fraction of the children do to stem the tide of a five-day program of humanistic teachings? Do you know when he said that quote? Within the last five years? 1934. For nearly 100 years, we have been giving our children over to not schools, but federally mandated indoctrination centers that corrupt their minds and their hearts, and we wonder why society is in the state that it is today. Corrupted minds can only produce chaos. And so no wonder we have what we have as the fatal fruit of one generation after the next pursuing godlessness in our society because we have federally mandated indoctrination centers pursuing an atheistic, secular, humanistic worldview. Not only do we see it in public education, but we see it in media. And when I say media, I'm speaking in broad categories. News, movies, social media. These are the great philosophers of our day spending billions of dollars a year to corrupt our minds, and Christians are just as guilty. I will hear many Christians be consumed with the media of our day, which is nothing more than propaganda, and they will say, I'm only watching it and listening to it because it's entertaining. And in the name of entertainment, we will absorb this junk and this garbage as our minds and our souls are rotting away. We will celebrate same-sex marriage we will celebrate all of the ideologies that are being pushed upon this next generation through the use of media. Public education and media, as long as it's entertaining and fulfilling its desired end. You know the greatest problem? Many well-meaning Christians and churches have fallen right into this trap. We've seen it in the last three to four years. Men and churches that we held in high esteem three, four, five years ago in the name of relevance and in the name of cultural accommodation, bow down to the idols of our culture and the idols of secular humanism. I just recently heard of a family that chose a church because they have bounce houses on Sunday morning. And the problem is even Christians in the church don't give a rip about doctrine and they don't give a rip about the preaching of the gospel and they'd rather pick a church based on entertaining their children. And we have allowed an entire generation to slip away and to have their minds corrupted instead of embracing the pursuit of a biblical worldview. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this age. A biblical worldview grounded in the gospel, a biblical worldview not conformed to this world. Third and lastly, a biblical worldview leads to transformation. Paul wants to make it very clear when he says, be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind, that how you think ultimately shapes how you act and live. Christianity has always been a thinking religion, never calling the people of God to check their minds at the door, but instead fill your mind with the things of God and that will therefore lead to transformation. It will affect and shape the way you act and the way you live. This was paradigm shattering 2,000 years ago. Eastern religions have always taught that 
the way that you're transformed and find inner peace is through clearing your mind. Greco-Roman paganism said the way you find peace is to turn off the mind or maybe even alter the mind. And here comes biblical Christianity that says, no, fill your mind with the things of God. Shove away the garbage of this world and renew your mind in order to be transformed. Why? Because the spirit of this age never quits. There's always another movie always another song, always another politician, and always another pastor that might be used to corrupt the minds of the next generation. And the reason we fill our minds with the word of God is so that we battle against the spirit of this age. And it leads us to a place of being completely transformed into the image and likeness of Christ complete transformation where Christ takes captive every part of our life private and public personal and social this is what it means to be transformed by the renewing of our mind the byproduct Paul tells us is that you might test and be able to discern the will of God what is good acceptable and perfect so that you might have a framework and a grid in the spirit of this age, where you're able to say, what I'm hearing and watching and listening, I can hear it and go, this is right and this is wrong. This is true and this is evil. This is good and this is bad. We need a framework, a grid for all of life. And the promise is here that you would be able to discern and test what is good perfect and acceptable so that you might know the will of God in your life. So what's the motivation? What would compel us to live a life completely transformed by God? Well, the answer comes in verse 1. Paul says the Christian life comes with a new motivation. I appeal to you, brothers... By what? By the mercies of God. Paul says, according to the mercies of God, present your life as a living sacrifice. The reason we can give our lives, body, mind, and soul, over to Jesus Christ completely is because on the cross, Jesus Christ gave himself over for us. That is the good news of the gospel. In light of his rich mercies, you can offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. I can give Christ my mind. I can give him my heart. I can give him my career. I can give him my finances. I can give him my family. I can give him my future because he gave himself for me in light of his mercy. Present your lives as a living sacrifice. It is the only reasonable, rational response. Listen to me very carefully. If you have never surrendered your life to Christ and you are operating your life with a worldview that is contrary to the things of God, that is a hopeless life and a hopeless existence. To have a worldview that is informed by anything other than the finished work of Christ will only lead to despair. I can't imagine looking at the world and looking at my life through any lens other than what Jesus Christ has done for me. Any other worldview, any other grid, any other framework can only lead to utter helplessness. If you have never surrendered your life to Christ, if you have never given, your way, given yourself completely to him, would you surrender your life today? Would you give yourself over to him? because he has surrendered himself for you. I want to ask you a question. What is your strategy? What is your game plan today to operate with a biblical world and life view? If the spirit of this age is not relenting, if the spirit of this age will not quit, what are we doing in the midst of the spirit of this age to not conform but instead develop a gospel-centered framework 
so that you're able to think about the origin of the universe, truth, sin, gender and sexuality, marriage and family, economics and finance, politics and government, all through one lens, the lens of God's infallible word. A few years ago, a poll was taken with parents in the church and 97% of parents in the North American church said they made it their highest priority to raise up their children with a biblical worldview. 97% of the parents think they're killing it and nailing it. But the numbers speak to the contrary. 57% of children that are raised in the church by the time they reach 15 years of age walk away from the faith. 72% walk away from the faith by the time they reach their freshman year of college. So as much as we think that we are the greatest influence in the lives of our children, no, the culture is winning. We are not the greatest influence. And we we are long overdue to recommit ourselves, to recommit as the people of God, to double down and say we will not lose this generation that we will invest all of our time and all of our resources to raising up a generation that loves the kingdom of God more than the kingdom of this world. To say, no, the culture will not win, that the spirit of this age will not take our children's minds, but that we as a church and as a school community will do everything in our power by God's grace and for his glory to not allow this generation to be swept away by the spirit of this age so that they may be transformed by the renewing of their mind. This is the Christian life. This is the purpose of this church. This is our holy calling. And so I leave you with this. By his mercy, I appeal to you, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, Lord, I pray that in light of your mercy, we might offer our lives, the entirety of our lives, as a living sacrifice to you. That our worldview would be grounded in one thing and one thing only, what Jesus Christ has done for us through his life and death and resurrection. May that be the grid, the framework, by which we see all of life, Lord, we live in hopeless times, and it's easy to despair, but we know the one person that makes all things new. We know the one person that can bring hope to the hopeless. And Lord, for a generation that's been deemed dead and lost to the things of God, may we, by your grace and for your glory, Bring this generation to the one, the only one, that can transform hearts and lives forever. May we be a people that are not conformed to the spirit of this age, but may we be people that are transformed by the renewing of our mind. If there's anyone here this morning that has never surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ, may they do so today. We appeal on the basis of the mercy of Jesus Christ, the one who offered himself as a sacrifice once and for all, that we in return and in response would offer our lives as a living sacrifice. So take our minds, take our souls, take our bodies, take our lives. We dedicate them to you. May we together pursue a new way of thinking a way of thinking that transforms us from the inside out for the sake of the glory of God and the advancement of his kingdom. May that be the high and holy calling of this generation in the 21st century. And Lord, would you work in us by your spirit? Would you cause there to be revival, revival that leads to reformation? Because this is my Father's world. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Let's stand and sing in response to what we've just heard and the call and the appeal from the Apostle Paul.
receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.